the importance of family. He knew the importance of getting the job done and getting a day's pay for a day's work. And he, he had the Virgin Islands at all times in his heart, in his mind. It was just something that you just wonder, where did this man come from? He was an ordinary guy that would try to face challenges and uh, try to help the people in uh, achieving what they want to acquire. You know, he like, he would try to help anyone that he could. He wanted to ensure and provide for the people of Virgin Islands the best government that you could think of. At times, like every governor, you have to make decisions at times that are not popular. And he had the 42 to do those things, as well as making a popular decision. So uh, for me, working with him for three years was a, an experience that will live for me forever. Cyril Emanuel King was born in a state slum, St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands, on April 7, 1921. His mother, Malvina Hall King, worked as a cook, and his father, Martin King, was a caretaker for several properties. The couple divorced when King and his siblings were young, and because of financial hardships, he was sent to live with his maternal grandmother. It might have been because of a uh, hardship of getting him back and forth, because uh, my, my mother, she, she had to work, and uh, maybe he was, he went over with our grandparents to live, uh, what do you call it, like a babysitter, you know, in those days. In those days, you, you know, there was always parental supervision, and if the parents were off, uh, off working, there was never a problem because the grandparents were at home. So um, it was interchangeable. And so um, if he were here now, he would speak equally of his parents and his grandparents. King attended St. Anne's Catholic School in a state barren spot and graduated from St. Mary's Catholic School in Christianstown. While in grade school, he met his future wife, Agnes Schuster. He and my mom were classmates, and he chased her with a water pistol every day after school. But um, that's as much as I can tell you. Uh, and the regular friends were uh, Louis Brown, um, and they became army buddies to the late Alex Farrelly. After graduation from high school, King was interested in joining the military. But before volunteering his services to the U.S. Army, he was inducted into the civilian Conservation Corps. When he was a young man growing up, he was part of the CCC, which is the Civilian Conservation Corps. And my father at the time, Honest Benjamin, was the one of the individuals who was responsible for the management of the program. And I think during that period of time, he got to know my father. And my father was also responsible for drafting him and uh, I was Daniel Farrelly and Walter I imagine uh, quite a few others into the military because my father was ran the selective service and St. Croix during World War I and Korean War. It was a semi-military thing, you know. Uh, it was real military, but uh, the federal government runs it, strictly federal. Everything like they have in the army we had, we had to wear the khaki pants and the shirts and everything, sleep in bungalows, you know. But sir, he sleep in a different bungalow to me. I sleep in A because my name is Adams. He sleep in something else, but I was in A, and uh, A, B, and C. Then the other titles go below. They had them down below in the big, big building, you know. They were selected because they were in need of a job. This was like a, a depression period like we have now. These boys were given a stipend. I think it's one third, not much and the parents were given two-thirds of what they were given by the military establishment. And so they were able to live, they were able to work, they were able to learn a trade, they were able to help their family, the family were able to help. And then there were a food distribution system where along with your 
Saipan, you were given food. Young men and young women, even when they were in grammar school, they were growing up, the girls were sent to handicraft school and the boys were sent to manual training school. So at a particular age and time, not because we were at war, they, that was like um, another level of progression. During his time at the Civilian Conservation Corps, King was recognized for his competitiveness, leadership, and business skills. Oscar Henry was charged with selecting a young man for the camp, and he often spoke highly of King to his wife. Cyril was an ambitious person, and my husband liked ambitious people. And if you were ambitious and ambitious enough for him to help you, he was always there and willing to help you in whatever way you want or ask him for help. And that's why he was so attracted to Cyril. After attending the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1940s, the United States was in the midst of World War II. And that is when King and a few of his childhood friends volunteered their services to the U.S. Army. There were two port companies the 872nd from St. Thomas, and the 873rd from St. Croix. Um, Louis Brown, um, Alex Farrelly, Cyril King, um, Earl Finch. Those were the four, the four musketeers. They went everywhere together. They were boyhood friends, and they remained so until the end. Um, they volunteered and they signed up. They went down to Puerto Rico to sign up. They were immediately accepted and shipped out to Camp Blachon. When King arrived to Camp Blachon in New Orleans, Louisiana, he was selected for the Army Leadership School. Upon completion of his training, King's instructors recommended him as a candidate for officers training school. However, he was assigned overseas. As I understand it from my mom, because he and my mother wrote to each other every day, they were engaged. Uh, that group was set to ship out to the Philippines, to Japan. Um, people will remember if you read your history book about Corregidor, um, Batang, uh, all in the Philippines, the day that VJ Day was declared, so they didn't go. Before leaving the Virgin Islands for his military duties, King had proposed to his childhood sweetheart, Agnes Schuster. When he returned to St. Croix in the summer of 1946, they were married on August 23rd. After moving to St. Thomas, King worked as a bookkeeper at Linquist 150 Garage and later at the Department of Public Welfare. But King, who was filled with ambition, wanted more. So the couple decided to relocate to New York. This was an exciting time for the King family. They were expecting their first and only child, Lilia. They left here, went to New York to my grandmother, immediately started looking for work. They were advised to uh, go down to Wall Street to pass a civil service exam. They passed it. They had openings at the American Veterans Committee and they were told that um, they had, they were ready to hire them. They said there was only one drawback. They were moving to Washington, D.C. the following week and this was Friday morning. And they said, that's no problem. We haven't unpacked. See you Monday. That's how they ended up in Washington, D.C. This played out to be a beneficial move for the King household. Another main reason the family migrated to the United States was to further their education. And while doing so, King got an opportunity that would change his life forever. They wanted to further their education. And of course, they had to work while they were doing it because my father did not, by virtue of his race, was not given the benefit of the uh, GI Bill. So his education, he worked and paid for. My mom worked and paid for. In fact, my mom went to, um, she took correspondence courses so that she could take care of me and work. And my father matriculated at American University um, in the afternoons from 3 until 11 p.m. because he worked from um, 7 until 3 at Hubert Humphrey's office. 
Senator Hubert Humphrey was a fresh face in Congress. He represented the state of Minnesota and was an advocate for the civil rights movement. During this time, the United States was plagued with racism and segregation. Humphrey often spoke openly about the need for change, and he exemplified his beliefs in equality by hiring King in 1949. As you know, we are dealing with the point of um, racial problems. And to be Afro-American, and then to be employed by a Caucasian, and by also by a senator, I think that was quite a, quite a move for our people, African uh, society, so to speak. I ended up in Minnesota, and um, I heard about hence Senator Humphrey and his, his push and his fairness and his uh, really backing the civil rights movement. He was outspoken. Uh, he met among the community civil rights workers, and he really wanted to make a change. And, you know, he made a change because he brought a person of color on his staff, and that was Cyril King from the islands. And that was fantastic. He was the first uh, person of color to be on the staff of a senator of the United States since Reconstruction. It's very likely that during the Reconstruction period when you had uh, people of color in the Congress that you had people assigned to senators. But in the modern era, he was the first person to be a member of the staff of a member of Congress. And Senator Humphrey was not just another senator. Um, senator Humphrey was a very important, a very influential senator, champion of civil rights, and someone who later on became the vice president of the United States and was a nominee to become president of the United States. So he was working for a very outstanding and influential person in the Senate and in American history. In that position, I think he was given the opportunity to work with the United Nations to travel overseas to represent Senator Humphrey in a number of various important, um, what's the word, issues or measures across the seas. So he got some international experience as well as national politics, ex political experience working with Senator Humphrey. Cyril was lucky. At that time, a black man could hold his high position. I know what I'm telling you. The relationship between King and Humphrey was one of importance, not only in the civil rights movement, but it would introduce King to the national and international realm of politics. He worked closely with Special Senate Subcommittee on Disarmament, which Humphrey was chairman. King quickly rose to the rank of a senior staff member, and during his 12 years working with the senator, King maintained close contact with the territory. He served as a deputy of the Virgin Islands Legislature to secure congressional action to amend the Organic Act. Although King enjoyed the work he was doing in Washington, his plans were to return home and enter the political arena. And in 1961, that opportunity arose. His work with the senator came in particularly handy when Congress was ready to consider the um, elected governor's legislation. And, um, he and my mom were powwowing for weeks. I, you know, I, it, it, it didn't make sense, of course, until I got older. But what he w they were discussing was that he wanted to apply for um, the gubernatorial position. But Ralph M. Piwanski was appointed by the late President Kennedy. But Kennedy appointed my father. Uh, to government secretary, which is now called lieutenant governor today. When he was offered that position, he sent to my husband, he asked him what he thinks about it. And my husband told him, go for it, go for it. Well, Humphrey sent him down as government secretary. During King's eight years serving as government secretary under the Democratic Party, his popularity grew amongst Virgin Islanders while the political climate evolved around him. What was once known as the Unity Party was now merged with the Democratic Party. As the parties changed in the territory, 
King seemed to become dissatisfied with his local political party. This dissatisfaction was also fueled by the tension that existed between him and then current governor, Ralph Piwanski. The Unity Party and the Democratic Party, the original Democratic Party, went to court. And I think in 1963, a decision was rendered where the Unity Party received the authority to use the Democratic symbol and to be called the Democratic Party. And of course, that angered a number of people. Cyril King was still a part of the Democratic Party then. But as time went on, I don't think he liked the politics of the Democratic Party. And he started to move away from the, the principles or the practices of, of the Democratic Party in the Virgin Islands. Well, unfortunately, uh, Governor King uh, was government secretary at the time, and Governor Piwanski did not get along very well politically. There were differences between um, both persons, so it was a sort of rocky um, relationship that both had. I believe during the course of the time he was government secretary, he was pretty well undermined by the Piwanski administration. I remember uh, the licensing section was under the office of the lieutenant governor. And for some unknown reason, they stripped his office of that. Uh, the same thing with the division of personnel. They stripped him of it all because he wouldn't do what Piwanski wanted him to do. There were some people who went to Washington to try to get rid of him as lieutenant governor. But um, he had a stout-hearted supporter in Hubert Humphrey, uh, the late Senator Hubert Humphrey, who had worked for. And uh, President Kennedy did not follow those who wished to get rid of him, even though they were some strong Democrats. That include the late Governor Piwanski. But there were people who, I mean, really wanted to do everything they could to get him out of office. But it was King's perseverance that kept him focused on his career. As political tension grew into rivalry within the local Democratic Party, a major advancement was also in the making. And on August 23rd, 1968, it became a reality. The Virgin Islands elective governor bill was signed by President Lyndon Johnson. The new legislation gave the people of the United States Virgin Islands the franchise to elect their governor, lieutenant governor, and other officials. During this time, King had become distant from the Democratic Party, and the beginning of a new political organization was in the making. He was associated with a group of persons that eventually became the independent citizen movement. But I, it began first as what was called Victory 66, and then evolved into a pol political movement and became a political party uh, subsequently. And uh, he associated himself with that, that group and um, was a very, uh, influential, respected member of the group. He was not just a member. It was his brainchild. And then, of course, you can't have a political party without members. And he uh, was able to interest many. He was the real impetus for the formation of the ICM party because he was, the things that they did to him as the number two official in this government uh, were not nice. The Independent Citizens Movement, which is also known as the ICM Party, soon gained the momentum that was needed for the first gubernatorial election. After being a registered Democrat since his days in Washington, King decided it was time for a change. So he entered the 1970 election as an ICM candidate. Having been appointed and serving as acting governor of the territory for four months, King felt he would be suitable to serve the territory as his first elected governor. However, this mission would not be an easy task. King would face the last appointed governor, Melvin Evans, and former territorial court judge, Alex Farley, his childhood friend, in the election. 
The 1970 election was a very robust one. I, that's the only way. I, it was hotly contested. It was robust in the sense that it was lively. People were out. The issues were clear. The sides were very well uh, defined. And Governor King was the man as far as we were concerned. I think one of the major things was the, the question he asked, prosperity for whom and at what cost? And uh, during those days, you could see that there was a section of the community that was doing extremely well, and others was doing very poorly. If you are not in the inner circles of the Democratic Party, you was out, out, outside the realm. And uh, we emphasized that and, you know, prosperity for whom and at what price? That, that was the key. He campaigned using the old traditional style, house to house, street rallies, fish fries. As a matter of fact, we started the fish fry, uh, fish fry habit. Uh, and so he was very experienced and a terrific speaker. All you had to do is tell him the topic, and he can speak for hours on it. Very good orator. And the way the people re reacted, boy, King had every chance to win the election. What we also knew that a large part of the group that uh, followed King were not registered voters at the time, were not full citizens at the time. But the crowd was there. And in the November 3rd election, uh, King came out first uh, among the three. And although King was victorious among the three candidates, the numbers were too close, and a runoff vote was now in order, and at the end, King was defeated. Cyril uh, won the popular vote, but he didn't garnish the 50 plus one, and so there uh, was a runoff, and of course the Democrats and so on, they sort of wait behind Governor Evans, and Governor Evans was elected uh, governor. I was very disappointed because I really wanted for posterity's sake, have two native sons elected, not one from Carolina and the other one from St. Croix, but two native sons, whether they were from, both were from St. Croix or both were from St. Thomas. All of us who were family supporters, we got together to decide who will we support, because naturally it seems that whoever we support would win, <laughs> you know? and. Uh, the, uh, there was standing room only at a meeting that night, and uh, most of the people supported uh, Evans. And uh, a few of us didn't like that. We, we felt that King was a real Democrat. He was one of us. He came first, and there's no reason why we shouldn't support him. So I made a speech that night <laughs> calling on us to support King as it being one of us and, and thing, but I was totally outvoted. <laughs> I, Love that vote. And the vast majority went with Evans. As a matter of fact, they left that night with this, what became a chant, thank heavens for Evans, you know? And of course, Evans won the election. For an old expression, the double banked him. And otherwise, the, 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 the majority of the time of the voters were Democrats. And for some reason, they didn't like uh, Cyril style of operation, his administrative style. And they were afraid that he, if he's elected, he's going to be dictatorial. The party loyalties in the Virgin Islands don't always, um, uh, that, uh, not always adhere to. And personalities sometimes play a stronger role than the principles and philosophy of the party. For with the support of the Democrats, the Republicans won over the ICM team of King and Smith. I don't know whether they regretted it or not, but I would just simply have to quote my mother when she spoke with Lee Carl at the headquarters the night that it was obvious that Daddy had lost the runoff, that it just wasn't his time yet, but it will come.
and King's chances of being governor would eventually come. His loss in the first gubernatorial election did not discourage him from public office. In 1972, he was elected into the Virgin Islands Senate, representing the district of St. Thomas, St. John. King was extremely successful in winning a seat in the legislature, but the political divisiveness between the ICM party and Democratic Party was alive and well in the Senate, and King would once again have to face political backlash. He had a staff of two. I happened to have been one of them, and his secretary was the other. Uh, at the time, our salary was $8,500, and he was, he insists that there's no way he could pay you more than he was making because at the time he was making nine. Uh, but the reason why I really went to work with him uh, after he asked me to come was I needed a commitment from him that he was in fact going to run for governor again. And once he gave me that assurance, I willingly went out and worked for him. When we first went in the Senate, he desperately wanted to be the Senate president. I mean, this would look good when he was, because he was planning to run for governor. And, um, and the Democratic senators were smart enough to divide his own party by saying, hey, uh, Tappy Malloy, Claude Malloy, the late Claude Malloy, why don't you be the Senate president? It should go to St. Croix because John Maduro of St. Thomas had the Senate presidency before. So, of course, that split the few senators. So Malloy uh, ended up getting the presidency. Cyril King did not get the presidency. Uh, made him very, very unhappy. Um, but uh, he was an effective senator. He was one of the most charismatic people you've ever met in your life. Those who were elected as members of the Representatives and Independent Citizen Movement uh, splintered off and formed a coalition with uh, uh, Senator Claude Malloy to support him as president. So ironically, um, although several of us ran together as candidates for the Senate, uh, we ended up being in the minority and others in the majority because of that split that occurred. And he was a member of the minority with me. and. Um, well, we did the best that we could to uh, continue to uh, achieve the changes in, in government. As King devoted his time and energy into his Senate duties, the second gubernatorial election was quickly approaching, and King had his eyes on a new running mate. He wanted someone that reflected his ideas, the people of the territory, and an individual who was loyal. He asked Wang Lui to be his running mate. Louis, who was an ICM member from the St. Croix district, served in the legislature with King. I don't think anybody really saw that coming. So, but Cyril realized the population of St. Croix, what, I don't know, what are we, 25% Hispanic now? Uh, at that time, I don't know, 20%, 25 maybe at that time. And um, really felt that that he could, uh, he was popular himself on St. Croix, and um, he needed to really sweep St. Croix. He, I don't think he was, felt he was that strong in St. Thomas. And so he did. I mean, the two of them uh, made a great elective team. He devoted a lot of time to developing a relationship with uh, uh, people of Spanish descent. Um, particularly residents of the estate profit area, and uh, even had, a, as I recall, a headquarters in, in his, his state profit. Um, in uh, 1974, um, when he ran again, um, that became even stronger uh, with Juan Luis being a Hispanic himself, being his uh, candidate for lieutenant governor, his running name. Unfortunately, I don't know, it just didn't happen that you didn't have a lot, you didn't have many, let me put it that way, you didn't have many of the Hispanics taking an active political role in the territory. So um, 
it just had to be. It just made sense that if you're going to unite all of the populations on the island, that you incorporated someone from every segment of the population into your political picture. That way, people don't feel disenfranchised. As the campaign season started for the gubernatorial election of 1974, excitement was in the air, and many people were energized about the King and Louis team. On the night of the elections, King and his supporters listened closely to the radio. And when the numbers started coming in, he knew that the governorship would soon be his. That was a night of jubilance. Uh, we had a feeling he was going to win. I mean, the, the trend was that the people was ready for him. Uh, when we heard, when we saw the conks coming in, we practically began to party ahead of time. We knew at that time that we needed someone who is going to be very vigilant, very attentive, and to stay close to the man because uh, we wasn't sure what the other side was thinking. We knew him as Pops. Said, Rivera, I believe we're going to win this thing tonight. You need to go up and uh, stay with CK. That's the, that, they used to call him CK for short. So I said, you sure? He said, yes. And I left and I went up to his house and reported in, sir, Pops sent me. One thing I didn't know, I didn't know he, he didn't drink. So I, I got into the, uh, the election for the first time in my life. And I said, wow, this deserves a drink. He said, you want a drink? And I said, yeah. And he went and he bought a bottle of cognac, brand new. It even had dust on it. And he said, you, what do you drink? I said, I drink that. He said, OK. So he brought one glass. And I said, you're not going to join me? I asked. He said, no, I don't drink. And I said, I'm sorry. He said, but you go ahead. You drink. I took a little shot, and that was it. That was the only drink I ever taken, I ever taken with him, or around him, not knowing that you know, he was not a drinker. He had a keen sense of what was going on around him, politically and otherwise. He had already started to plan his uh, cabinet, his security forces, everything. Everything King had planned went into action on January 6, 1975. That was the day Governor Cyril Emanuel King was inaugurated. Residents throughout the territory took to the streets as parades and motorcades made their way on each island. King immediately started picking members of his cabinet. The King administration is considered to have been one of the youngest and was comprised of men and women from all political parties. King had plans on making changes in government. He often expressed the need for more financial accountability and better work ethics in government employees. During the previous administration, there, there was no question that you had people collecting paychecks, never see a day's out of work. You had people working elsewhere, still getting a check. And uh, his position was that if you're going to collect a government check, you're going to be on the government's job. And he expect an eight hour work day for eight hours pay. He did not look kindly to finding someone uh, or hearing of someone uh, meeting at a bar when they should be at uh, work, because that's something that would get him uh, very uh, motivated and to see that that didn't happen again. Remember one time he, he was uh, driving through Frenchtown and they had an unusual amount of government vehicles in the general area. And so he asked us to stop. Uh, he ordered his driver to stop really. And then he went into Normandy. My God, you see people flying out of Normandy. And the guys were getting out of Normandy Bar, getting back uh, the best way they can to public works and sub base, because they heard, here comes Governor King. And he was a no-nonsense uh, fellow. Say, well, King will, will jump out of his office and go check on a project. 
He'll check on a gang on the road. If they're supposed to get a road, he'll just go by it and start jump out of the car and, and, and check on the guy. Of course, now what does that mean? Every man loafing, grabbing a shovel, or doing some work. <laughs> See, the king is coming. <laughs> the word gets out. You know? <laughs> That's right. That's how he was. He was a, a get it done type of guy. And that's what you have to really respect that we respect about him. Sometimes we'll go in the different um, government offices. Uh, he'd be there for 8 o'clock. And sometimes uh, the person for the desk, he's sitting in the desk. The person for the desk come in late. And he just give, I guess he gives them a reprimand. Uh, some of them, I heard he sent them home, tell them to take the band's idea off. Everybody knew where he stood, and uh, he was very much admired by some, and some others he was not so admired because some felt he was too strict, too stern, in a way too conservative in some ways. And he was a conservative in fiscal matters in particular. He wanted to set the example to make sure that the funds that he received were properly spent, and it was kept within the amount that was given for any particular expenditure. Uh, therefore, he did not want at any time for the records to show, while his, uh, during his term, that we actually had to go to the legislature to ask for additional money or we overspent whatever was, whatever was allotted for that particular guard, whether for salaries, whether for benefits, whether for material and supplies, whether for contractual services. Whatever it is, there was an amount that was earmarked for each of those categories. Cyril wanted to always keep the labor force, government personnel, at a certain level. That's why some people, I think, was a little annoyed because he, he was not one for a lot of, oh, you supported me, so here's a little token of appreciation. No, he wasn't that kind of fellow. He's not going to do anything for you because you're his family member. He, he worked. He took his job as working for the people, not for his family. That's the type of guy he was. As a matter of fact, I tried to get a job with him in the administration. That time I was working at Hess. He said, well, Matt, I th think it's better if you stay in Hess and learn a trade, which I did. King's no-nonsense style did not appeal to everyone. Some people thought the new governor was too strict, while others thought he was determined and took action. One critical move King is known for is the expansion of the airport on St. Thomas. They operated on a World War II hangar for years. Their direction was to build room capacity. And at the time, building that capacity he saw was essential. And at the right time, he wanted to move for, the again, the expansion of the airport to increase lift. You have to have rooms to have passengers come in. We don't stay at an airport and sleep there. And again, what was interesting in the financing process, uh, the airlines became signatories to the notes, where in St. Croix it's been a different issue. Mm -hmm. Good thinking, clear thinking, understanding at that time St. Thomas was really the driving force in tourism, and to become continually successful, you had to upgrade your airport. And there were so many fits and starts about building this new airport or expanding the airport and they had plan A, plan B, plan one, two, five, all kind of plans. And he called everybody in government house one day with all the plans and all the schemes. Everybody say what they had to do and the end he say, gentlemen, we're going with plan five B. Let's go to work. And they finally built, extended the airport in St. Thomas. I think one can say without dispute that uh, this, the improvement of the St. Thomas Airport probably would have occurred long after if it was not for the fact that Cyril King saw that it was time for us to put that, make a decision on that and, and move forward. Besides making strides in improving infrastructure in the territory, King was also a firm believer in agriculture. The governor thought it was an important facet of the community and many times he supported young people who showed an interest in farming. We, within a very short period of time, cleared lots of land, lots of property, and began to produce food at the Charlotte Molly High School. Shortly thereafter, 
apparently Governor King heard about us and he came and visited us. I don't think he knew what to expect, but when he came and he saw what we were doing, he, be he began to smile. He saw about 10 young men who were serious, who were diligent about what they wanted to do, who had prepared land and producing food and selling food too. When he came, he spoke with us for quite a long time, but he was basically assessing our needs and trying to decide how he could help us. The following day, he came back, actually he did not come back. He sent his uh, assistant commissioner of agriculture, his um, chief of staff, I think, or administrator Saro, Leveron Saro, and they came with a truck or two of goods and supplies to help us do an even better job. We was uh, doing agriculture out in Tutu, and uh, he came up there to visit us, and he saw that we was doing some good agriculture works, and um, he saw that we had some tools and the tools wasn't looking fit enough to um, do the work. So he told us he gonna get us some brand new tools. So um, the same day when he left and so he promised to bring us new tools. He promised to look into the legality of the land which we were doing agriculture and that's out in Tutu. And then uh, the next day he, he sent a, a truckload full of brand new tools to my house. The name of the group at the time was Ujama. And they started to plant, and they invite him down. So when the crops began to come up and he went down, and the first question he asked them, now come show me where you got this marijuana plant. Because he was almost certain that's what they was going to, to do. Uh, when he was, got down on the property, he was very impressed. Uh, impressed to the point where agriculture was ordered to make sure that if they needed a bulldozer, they get the bulldozer. Uh, they, I believe they put some pumps down at the, the dam in order for them to get the water. And they, after they begin to produce, he went and bought them a truck so they could get the produce from Bordeaux to town. While supporting young people in various farming programs, Governor King also implemented the Virgin Islands Youth Commission. During King's days as government secretary, he emphasized the need to encourage and support the youth of the territory. He often spoke at graduations, summer camps, and just about anywhere expressing a lead to uplift the young men and women of the U.S. Virgin Islands. During the early or the middle 70s, Governor King wanted to develop programs that would basically meet the needs of a cross-section of Virgin Islands youth. And his mandate to me was to plan, implement, and develop a program. Once that was done, I provided him with a working plan of what I envisioned that I think would be necessary. And he endorsed what um, I proposed in terms of developing a summer youth employment program, um, development of a public arts program, steel band, farming program, and several other programs, uh, and he endorsed it 100%. He likes sports, and he likes the youth. And at the time, we had the BD basketball tournaments. We had the double baseball. Double baseball, I ran that league from almost for eight to nine years. And every time that we would have the opening of the league, he would always be there to be sure that he would say a few words of encouragement. He felt that um, the youth was the future of the Virgin Islands and to get them moving toward being productive citizens that he was, had, had some types of programs for them and, we, and after school programs so they could be involved in baseball, softball, uh, soccer and he ensured that we got involved into the agriculture also. He was into feeding ourselves, taking care of ourselves. So he put, put those two together and said, you know, we, we got to make sure that our, our future is locked in. Along with the ideas of supporting and encouraging the youth, the governor also felt that it was important to have good relationships with other Caribbean nations. King often traveled throughout the region and became very close with other heads of states. 
One of his closest friends was Premier Robert Bradshaw from St. Kitts and Nevis. The Governor King was a Caribbean person and I admired him for that. He believed that we should have close ties with the rest of the Caribbean because we were actually part of the Caribbean. And therefore he was very close to uh, Premier Bradshaw and close to the people from the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, at that time, a large number of persons had migrated to the U.S. Virgin Islands from the other Caribbean islands, and they found a champion in Governor King. I was also a good friend of uh, Premier Bratcher. Uh, I think he wanted Caribbean integration. He felt that the Virgin Islands was part of the Caribbean region, and we should not be isolated from our Caribbean brothers and sisters, because if you look at genealogies, you would find that almost everyone from the Virgin Islands has connection to other islands. He believed in, in, in integration. And also I believe, this is just my belief, that he loved Bratcher's style. Yeah, I think it was very, very close with Premier Bratcher because when I, I was his attorney general, and as a result of that, I had a close working with, relationship with his attorney general, Attorney General Lee Moore. You see? So, so, so it was not just with St. Kitty that he was also in, he had relationship with the birds of Antigua, and also, of course, with the British Virgin Islands. Governor King had relationships with many worldwide leaders, including royalty. While in Washington, D.C., at the press club, he met Her Majesty, Queen Marguerite of Denmark, and in 1976, the Queen and her family visited the U.S. Virgin Islands. The Governor and First Lady hosted several events during their historic trip to the territory. She was so human, so very, very sweet, but in company. And what was so nice when she came on the trip, she came with a couple of her cousins, along with her fa immediate family. And she, she created such a wonderful bond with my parents. And she just loved the fact that we accepted her the way we did. At my young tender age, you know, to meet with these high officials, uh, it, was, it was a time that I don't think I could forget. Um, I remember at the dinner at Government House, we. Uh, sat around and I expect to sit right next to my wife, you know, to find out that uh, she was at one end of the table and I was at some place else. But uh, the Queen was very impressed uh, and I'm sure that uh, she remarked that uh, they made a mistake when they gave up the territory. When the governor wasn't handling political affairs, he enjoyed taking walks. In his spare time, King loved to go to the annual horse races and he also liked baseball. He even organized a softball team called Swing with King. But it was not his athletic skills that most people recall. It was his compassion and the love he had for the people of the territory. Every Thursday, he at noon, he decides we're going down the street for a walk. And his driver will drive the car to the other end of the main street. And we'll walk down the main street, chit-chatting, going into stores. Then we'll head to the waterfront, we'll buy some ice cream. And two of us with cones, eating ice cream cones down the street. And he was the individual that if you had something to say to him, he'd stop. he will listen to what you have to say, and then when he says, sorry, we'll take care of it. So I will make notes and... Uh, make sure that whatever the problem was, was taken care of. Well, there's so many stories, but the one that resonates in my mind all the time is occurred when we was walking the main street and there was a lot of litter. And he asked who was in charge of litter collection at the at Public Works. And we told him it was, the, it was a person that he served in the army with. And so he went back up to government house and he called the person. The person said, Governor, what are you referring to, litter or garbage? And the governor said, I'm going to be back down in an hour. I will not clean up. You will be litter or garbage because I will take your resignation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's the one I recall most often. King was on a mission on improving the functionality of government. He was a very hands-on leader, and he expected the best from government employees. However, King's mission was cut short in the fall of 1977. While traveling on the mainland, the governor took ill, and that was the beginning to a tragic end. He called us from Chicago and told us he was coming home early. And mommy, I, she, she looked a little puzzled, but she didn't say anything to me. And um, when I got home later in the day, she said, your father's back. And he, I said, what's the matter? She said, he's so thin. And that was the beginning. That was September of 1977. People were very sad. The churches prayed for him when he was sick. There were all types of uh, services, and the people were very concerned. I, I, I recall when he came from Sloan Kettering at the airport. Thousands of people were there to greet him. And you could see he was sick. And they prayed and they prayed as to show you that the admir admiration that they had for him. He was still in charge. He, he, he did his work from home. Uh, and he had an able Lieutenant Governor Wang Lui. But uh, it wasn't the same. It's not seeing him in the office, not hearing his voice, because almost every single morning we meet. You know, the one thing I tell you, I've heard about people getting sick or getting weak, you know? I could never believe anybody could be so weak that they couldn't sign a name, you know? And I remember there were some documents that some of the commissioners and so on, uh, I think Peter Dizella, some of them, they wanted him to sign. And they took it into him in the sick bed. But when they brought it out to me, I said, no, we can't use that. That is not Cyril King's signature, you know? But he was so weak. Uh, he passed at 9.05 p.m., January 2nd, 1978. Um, it, and I'm probably the only, only person who remembers this uh, because he had been in a coma uh, it was just the, you know, the bedside dialysis. It just wasn't, nothing was working anymore. And he woke up, patted my mom on her cheek, and they exchanged a gaze at each other that is indescribable. And he, a little smile, he said, thank you. He closed his eyes and he was gone. Immediately thereafter, I stayed with the nurse to start dressing him to go downstairs to the morgue. And um, we, Mommy and I were whisked off to the administrator's office on West Wing because this was at Knut Hansen. And, um, Judge Christian, Judge Almer Christian, Chief Judge of the District Court, swore Wang Luis in as the succeeding governor. Governor King was diagnosed with stomach cancer and died January 2nd, 1978 from his illness. His untimely death was a sad moment in the history of the U.S. Virgin Islands and the entire Caribbean. People, people just simply couldn't believe it. Uh, it was a mourning moment, it was a sad moment uh, as a community. We realized that life must go on, so we had to carry on, but it was not easy. Everyone was in mourning. The, the Virgin Islands was in mourning. As a matter of fact, the Caribbean was in mourning when he died. It was a sad day for us here. Right in the middle of his administration, when it was going so well, you know, you thought, why? You're getting so much done. 
man. It just ended. His untimely passing was a very difficult issue to deal with because this was a man of vision who wanted to do so many things. And um, he did not get to accomplish it within the three years that he was in office. And for me, that was um, not easy to, to, to deal with. So uh, it, it was hard. It was very difficult. Governor King lay in state throughout the territory and was buried at the Kings Hill Cemetery on St. Croix. He had 10 months left in his term. Many people said he was a visionary, a man of the people, and he was an individual who simply wanted more accountability in government. I think Governor King's legacy is proof that he was, I mean, again, it was a short tenure, but where he was setting out, using his, even his national relationships, he was setting out to build a platform where we could have a better quality of life altogether through pride and service. Even though he, his tenure in office was brief, he did leave a legacy for other governors and lawmakers to emulate. And it makes no difference whether he was an icm -er or a Democrat or Republican. I think his style would have been the same for the people, a man of the people, as they used to refer to him, the white stallion, the gray-haired stallion. And that is what a lot of people would still say about when they talk about Sarah King, oh, the gray hair stallion. And even though he has been gone now for a number of years, you can see the twinkle and the sparkle in people's eye when they talk about Sarah King. We here in the U.S. Virgin Islands have an enviable number of public holidays. We celebrate these holidays through our music and our song. Through our music and our song, we express the beauty of the people of these islands as well as the beauty of the islands themselves. Would you join and share this experience with us?